We're in Philippians chapters, uh, chapter 1. And you remember this, services that were provided, that provide pre-cooked meals. You ever heard of one of these, like DoorDash? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Mm -hmm. Oh, you actually know these things. Mm -hmm. How about this? The, there's a service that provides pre-cooked meals in your home are not unique, but there's a company in London that's added a new niche. House Bites uh, delivers restaurant quality cuisine to your kitchen for about $15 per entree and offers an optional dirty pans service. <laughs> for an extra eight bucks, they will deliver the containers in which the food was prepared so that your guests will have the illusion that you actually made the food. Oh. Are you willing to pay eight bucks for that? Oh. Everybody, everybody got the gist of that. Okay. What's the difference between happiness and joy? By the way, that's the only thing I didn't like about our scripture reading this morning, is that I didn't see the word joy go by. And if you look in your Bible, you'll see there's a lot more joy uh, than there is in happiness. Because we're going to talk about this. What's the difference between happiness and joy? Happiness comes from the word happenstance, from which we get the word circumstance. So, but joy is internal. Happiness is External. In other words, you all remember that. Remember you when you went home from Disneyland? Were you happy? No, you weren't. You were sad that you now were leaving the happiest place yeah. on earth. In other words, that was where the happy place was, and now we're leaving, so we're not. Okay. The background of the story that we're going to look at here is that Paul, for the last four years, has been miserable in circumstances. He has spent Two years in prison in Caesarea for what we would call trumped up charges. Then he put on a, he was put on a ship to go to Rome to appear before Nero. And Nero wasn't always the most nicest person toward Christians. But on the way there, remember what happened to him? Book of Acts, remember there was a shipwreck? Remember there was a picking up wood on a stranded island? And what happened in the wood? Poisonous snake. You, you, that's the way your vacations are, right? You just want to go with it. And uh, he waits for the winter there and then continues on to Rome, and then he spends another two years. Now he's in Rome, he spends another two years there uh, waiting for a decision, and uh, eventually what will happen is we all know that he will be executed. During this two year period in Rome, he is chained to a guard. He absolutely has no privacy. Every, you know, differentiated in terms of time, every four hours or every six hours, depending on how you want to count it, they would bring in a new guard. Yet in spite of all these situations, Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 18, you're looking it up in your Bible, Philippians 1, 18, I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. So the question is, what is Paul's secret? How does he stay positive in prison in his triumph over troubles, delight in difficulties, and stay so positive? In other words, we would say joyful. How does he do this? In spite of the fact that everything is not really turning out the way he planned. Well, Paul's going to give us four secrets. Uh, they're listed on the back of your bulletin, the four essentials for being joyful. Number one is that I need a perspective to live from. I need a perspective to live from. Every one of you have had problems. In fact, you brought your problems with this morning. Just don't share, but no, no, no. <laughs> uh, your problems are not so in, important as to how you are, it's how you are looking at your problems. The problem's one thing. If the question is, how do you look at your problems? And the way you look at the problem is much more important than the problem. Your perspective makes the difference in how you deal with problems. Look at verse 12. We're in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really, has really served to advance the gospel. In other words, I can see the best even in the worst. I can see God at work in the problems, even when they don't go my way. In other words, he, go, he goes on to say that non-believers are being witnessed to. They're being witnessed to by my attitude toward them. In other words, and with that, believers are being encouraged. Verse 13. As a result, has been clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for a reason. I'm in chains because of Christ. Paul has always wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to go to Rome because he wanted to start a mission there. 
But instead, God put him in prison, and then being in prison, what would he do? He would write the New Testament letters that you and I are experiencing. And so he's chained to this palace guard. That, by the way, the Praetorium Guard, this was the crack elite troops of the Roman Empire. They were personally chosen by Caesar himself as his bodyguards. They were the highest paid people in the empire. In other words, tough to bribe. When they retired, they retired after 12 years. And as soon as they retired, then they became leaders in the Roman Senate. They went into the Rome to be able to then uh, become something else. And there is a more strategic group that Paul was now handcuffed to than to have these guys that were going to be now leaders in the Roman Empire. For two years, these guards heard Paul pray, preach, dictate epistles. They listened as he conversed with other people who were welcome to come and see him and talk with him. And, and he dealt with people the consequences of sin, the forgiveness that is offered through Christ. And this way, the gospel began to penetrate the imperial army. None of this would have happened if Paul had chosen instead to sit there with the guard and complain about, you know, yeah, I got you again. I mean, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> no, God put Paul in Rome and Nero paid the bill. And he gets chained to future leaders every four hours or six hours. These guards had an inside route into the emperor, and as a result, even some of Nero's family became believers. And by the way, history tells us that Nero had his wife, his mother, and his children all killed because they had become believers. Paul writes, verse 14, because of my chains, most of the brothers of the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. In other words, my attitude towards problems has encouraged other people. In other words, courage is courageous, is contagious. It's, it spreads. When you are courageous, that helps somebody else out. Other believers became bolder because of what Paul was doing. Instead of feeling frustrated and victimized, Paul laughed at the open window of the opportunities that were now right before him and the possibilities. And so Paul's joy being, became contagious. So how can a person think like that? What kind of person is he? Well, the answer is, is that neither difficult nor complicated, but it all depends on the question we ask ourselves. Either we're going to, we're going to ask it in a negative way. Why did this happen to me? Or in a positive way, how is going this result going to bring some benefit to God because of my life? There's a pastor who writes about his trip to Russia, or really at the time was the Soviet Union, some 60 years ago. The date is July 1960. The place is Moscow. The setting is an obscure Baptist church packed to overflowing on a Tuesday night. He says, it took me several days to get information just to find the place. The taxi driver didn't even want to let me out in front of the church. Never would I be the same after worshiping with those believers who pay such a price for their witness. It cost many of them their jobs, their positions, and even family relationships to their family because they have publicly expressed their love for Jesus Christ. But he says, etched in my memory is the glow of the determined faithfulness to Jesus Christ which radiated from these suffering believers that were there packed into that church building. Little did they realize, and he says, little did I realize, that 30 years later, after some of them were dead, their faith would prevail, and the atheistic Marxist ideology that was so controlling would crumble. It would crumble into history. I've been asked at different times, what is the most discouraging thing that you've seen in ministry? Mm -hmm. I think it's the same answer that I would hear other pastors say. The issue that deeply distresses me is seeing those who ought to be the most mature in the faith, the ones who know the Word of God well, have experienced the blessings of spiritual growth and fellowship, and have actually seen and witnessed God's power demonstrated time and time again. 
turn their backs on faith and embrace sin. And by the way, that's much more discouraging than when a new, untrained Christian falls into sin through some temptation. It's hard to hear, especially as in my own profession of other ministers. And uh, it just breaks your heart. Yet there are Christians, as Paul is talking about here, that are willing to stand up. The progress of the gospel was Paul's passion. How about you? What, what motivates you? What's, what, what sucks up your energy? What dominates your time? What makes you tick? It was of little consequences to Paul what happened to his own body or his own career. He says, I do not consider my life of any account. In Acts 20, he says, I don't uh, uh, consider my life of any account as dear to myself, in order that I may finish the course that I may finish the ministry that God has provided for me. In other words, life, possessions, clothes, recognition, reputation, prestige. I'll yield it all up to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. This guy like Joseph, remember what Joseph said years earlier to his own brothers, he said, who had sold him off? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. With that same kind of mindset, I think Paul is choosing to count the blessings rather than the disappointments that are taking place. Looking at everything from that perspective, he realized that what seemed to be a waste or a detour, in fact, was really God's divine perspective. What seemed like a delay had proven to be a divinely appointed opportunity for the message of Christ. A very poignant note is written in 2 Timothy. Paul writes to Timothy and he's in prison and he writes, it really is his, it's his last time in prison. And uh, winter is coming, he's lonely, he longs for a copy of the Old Testament, being the Hebrew Bible. And he asks Timothy to come, come and see me. And then he writes these, he says, all in Asia have turned against me. That's a tremendously painful cry. And it hurt Paul when fellow Christians turn against him. Yet, if the gospel goes forward, if more people hear of Christ as a result, Paul's saying, then I will rejoice. Even if I, I, I commend that attitude. By the way, I commend that attitude to each of you. Yes. Don't ask the question, is this fair? Do I deserve this? Why doesn't somebody else get this problem? Why have I got this problem? Why can't somebody else have that problem? But rather, you should ask the question which Paul asks, is Christ's name being proclaimed? Are my circumstances providing an opportunity for more people to come to the Lord? I believe the perspective you need to live from is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. That's where the joy comes. Now, what's the lesson here? God has a purpose behind every one of my problems. When you get that perspective, you are on your way to a joyful living. God has a purpose behind every one of my problems. Paul says that God has a purpose behind all my problems, therefore I have a perspective as to how I'm supposed to live. Let's go to number two. I need a priority. I need a priority to live by. When things get tough, I need to know what's really important in order to distinguish the trivial from the significant. Uh, in other words, I can be living a life either based on problems or priorities. In other words, what's your choice? Either you'll decide what's important in your life or you'll let other people decide what's important in your life. If you don't choose your priorities, you'll go around putting off fire after it at one after another and living your life simply from one problem to another problem to another problem to another problem and not really choosing what's important. In verse uh, 15 and 16, Paul says, not only am I a prison, in prison, but if you want to kick a man when he's down, there are guys out there attacking my ministry. They're jealous, they're envious, they're criticizing me, and I'm in prison. If you want something that will steal your joy quicker than anything else, is to have 
people criticize you. What is Paul's response? Look at verse 18. So what? <laughs> so what if some people preach with wrong motives? So what if some are overly interested in themselves? So what if there are some who take unfair shots at me? So what? In other words, what Paul says, what matters is that Christ is being preached. And that's the thought alone that intensifies his joy. In other words, this is Paul's priority, that Christ would be glorified, that Christ would be preached. But, there was a time, however, when Paul was not joyful, in spite of what others preached. On the contrary, his advice back in the book of Galatians, remember chapter 1? Yeah, there were certain things that he even said for saying that you should be anathema. You should be cursed. Remember the verse? If we are an angel from heaven should preach to you contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. If any man is preaching to you a different gospel contrary to the one that you receive from us, let him be anathema. By the way, you know what group this is. In other words, if we are an angel, what group out there has a message from an angel? Well, they're called the Mormons. They have an angel named Moroni. Brought the gospel to them. Wrong. In other words, and by the way, it's interesting when you have uh, Mormons come to, your, come to your house and you open the Bible and you show them Galatians and say, well, it says we shouldn't receive it from an angel. And then there's this silence like, <laughs> Why does Paul say in one letter, let him be accursed, and in another, so what? Isn't that sort of contrasting condemnation and indifference? Isn't that contradictory? Let me just say clearly, no, it isn't. And the reason is that in Galatians, the apostle is denouncing those who are garbling the gospel of grace and attacking it by making it into a message of works. Be very careful. So our lesson here is focus on what really counts. That's the only question in the book of Philippians. The only question here. A question of priority. Paul says he said he had to set his priorities, his values, and not let little things steal the joy that comes out of that. There's a book called The Golden Shore. It tells the story of Adoniram Judson, one of the first American missionaries that were sent overseas. And of course, we are all familiar with that day. Uh, he was at the very beginnings of the American Baptist. He went overseas some 200 years ago. Many of you know his story. He was a brave ambassador of Jesus Christ to serve the Lord in what was then known, and by the way, still known, as Burma. After 14 years of enduring wretched imprisonment, life-threatening disease, all he had to show for all of his pains, for all of what he had done, were the graves of his wife and his children. He was alone, and yet he remained faithful. He wrote that if he had not felt certain that every trial was ordained by God's infinite love and mercy, he could have not survived the accumulated sufferings that he went through. Jensen understood that his trials were a part of the sovereign plan of God. And though he must have longed to be with Christ and enjoy the fellowship of his beloved family that had gone on to glory, he also longed to meet the needs of those lost Burmese people. Therefore, he prayed that God would allow him to stay, to translate the entire Bible into Burmese, and then to preside over a native church that would have at least 100 believers. Both of those happened. Judson had the spirit of the Apostle Paul, who longed to be with Christ, but yet his desire was also to be useful to there, to the church there. We must have a perspective to live from. We must live a, a priority to live by and know what's important. And with that, I hope that you also would say, I have a, a desire to be used by God. We're only going to do points one and two, so just to give you an understanding. There's a California pastor who writes this. I spoke at a memorial service for a Silicon Valley executive and his five-year-old son. He was facing a disintegrating marriage, so with that, this man committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Unable to leave his son behind, he killed his son also. 
before he took his own life. But the faith of the widow and the mother of that child had been a tremendous encouragement to those who knew her. She told her pastor that there are so many people that I have come across who have had similar experiences and know the deep, deep heartache, pain. But there are many groups that are ministering to those needs. And she said, maybe this is what the Lord wants me to do something. In the midst of her tremendous anguish in the days of numbness, she already learned that her past suffering is preparation for what ministry God has for her. Do you view your present restrictions as opportunities to spread the gospel? Your prison may be a boring job or an illness that limits you. But there are no circumstances that cannot provide an opportunity for the spread of the gospel of Christ. And far from being a hindrance, your present obstacle can be an opportunity for God to display something in you. The great power that he can do through your life. Billy Graham once told a young pastor, he said, As long as you're willing to burn yourself out for Jesus Christ, the world will come if for no other reason than to watch the flame. What should I live? What should I live by? Proverbs 3 says, in everything you do, put God first. And he will direct you and crown your efforts with success. That's what counts. Putting God first. His perspective. His priorities. His direction to my life. May that be our desire. Let's bow it. We're thankful for our wonderful God for the love that you have shown us, but also that you give us perspective on life. You give us, as we see in what Paul was going through, you give us wisdom and guidance that the world doesn't see. And Lord, we to thank you for that. And with that, you also give us a priority of how we are to live. May our priority be always that Christ would be glorified, that Christ would be proclaimed. You would do this powerful things. We look at our own lives and say, well, what can you do with me? May we say that to the Lord and let the Lord speak to us. May there be doorways that open up that God would use to glorify his name. Thank you for this opportunity we have to learn of Paul and his life and how he was used for you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.